2017, Toro Rosso had a problem. Daniel Kvyat was given the old heave-ho after mutual dissatisfaction with the team, and so Pierre Gasly was drafted in to fill the void, making his Grand Prix debut in Malaysia. Before the United States Grand Prix, Gasly had to vacate that seat and head to Japan to contest the final round of that year's Super Formula Championship, which he was in contention to win before the final weekend was cancelled due to a typhoon. But by the time that happened, he was already stuck in Japan, and a replacement driver was needed to be found. What's more, the other driver Carlos Sainz had headed off to Renault for some reason, which meant that Toro Rosso needed to replace both drivers for the event. Kvyat was drafted back in to fill one of them, with the remaining seat being the source of much speculation. Now, as a proud Kiwi, my answer for who should have gotten that seat was more than obvious. Antonio Felix da Costa. Huh? I mean, the dude had done quite a bit in his racing career to warrant a shot at Formula 1, right? And his speed in open wheelers was beyond question, right? Well, instead, they went with Brendan Hartley, world endurance champion, Le Mans winner, and tonsophobe. For us Kiwis, it was great to see a fellow New Zealander back on the Formula 1 grid. After all, he was the first New Zealander to take the grid since Mike Thackwell back in 1984. Over the next year and a half, however, Hartley never really came across the dream results that everyone wanted, and more crucially, that the Sith Lord wanted. By the end of 2018, he was out of a drive, and New Zealand was once again without a Formula 1 driver. If I'm brutally honest, I never really bought into Hartley as a Formula 1 driver. Not that he wasn't talented, but because I always thought of him more as a GT specialist, and that there were others out there who were perhaps better suited for a shot at Formula 1. I know, it's rich coming from a guy who makes badly cut videos for a living, but what the hell. Fast forward to the present day, and set your attention onto Liam Lawson. Now, this dude is a little bit different, because without wishing to sound cliched here, he might just be a driver that a whole nation has been waiting decades for. Beginning on the karting scene, Liam would win multiple championships in karting and would begin his journey into racing cars with the Speed Sports Scholarship, a program set up by Sabre Motorsport that helps young up-and-coming drivers break through the mould with a season in the New Zealand Formula First Series. After winning the scholarship, he would take one win and three podiums as well as Rookie of the Year honours. Decent beginnings when you consider that the team was experiencing funding issues and being run by a notorious cookie monster. The following year, he would venture into the New Zealand Formula Ford Championship. Now, the season wasn't a dominant to be honest. It was more of a annihilation, winning all but one of the races that year, and became the youngest Formula Ford champion in New Zealand, as well as the youngest Formula Ford champion in the world. With this momentum behind him, Liam would head over to Australia to compete in the local Formula Ford championship. He had a brilliant beginning to the season, although a rubbish array of results at Queensland and Phillip Island left him second in the standings that year, finishing P2 in Australian Formula 4. Wow. But with the CEF4 experience under his belt, he went over to Germany to compete in the ADAC, or sorry, ADAC, championship with Van Amersfoort, pitting himself with the creme de la creme of F4 talent. He had some decent teammates that year, the likes of Joey Elders and Frederick Vesti, it wasn't too bad. And this was his first season in Europe, so as long as he's in the ballpark, right? Well, yeah, he did a little bit better than that. Despite the occasional rubbish result, Liam would finish P2 overall that year, fueled by three wins that year, and finished ahead of all of his teammates from Van Amersfoort, and toward the tail end of the season, competed in the Asian F3 series in a one-off appearance in Sepang. He took pole position in both qualifying sessions, and won every race with the fastest lap in all of them. A total clean sweep. So, he was riding a high wave of momentum, and it was about to gain even more steam. At the beginning of every year, the Toyota Racing Series in New Zealand allows for drivers to come over and sharpen their skills ahead of the new season, racing on tracks that have been outdated since 1839. The big focus heading into that year was on Marcus Armstrong. This cat was in the Ferrari Driver Academy, was mega in the European karting scene, was the Italian F4 champion, and came painfully close to beating Richard Vershaw and Bobby Schwartzy for the previous year's TRS championship. Everyone expected him to win. Well, when I say everyone... Brave racing! The Kiwis side by side as they come towards the line. Good, good on you. But look at this. Lawson's got the upper hand. This is going to end in tears. No, it doesn't. Lawson takes second place. And he's now just made a Ferrari Academy driver look pretty, pretty ordinary there as that was a superb... And that was not the only good performance from him that season. He took five wins that year with some awesome driving. 
with the occasional not so awesome driving. But by the end of the season, he was the champion and declared the winner of the New Zealand Grand Prix after the Stewarts took a dim view of Armstrong's defending. It wasn't just the result he got, but how he got those results. The f it, I'm gonna take this position even if you don't like it mentality had F1 Academies falling over themselves to get him. More specifically, he had caught the eye of Dr. Helmut Marco. Oh boy. While there was interest shown from Renault and Ferrari, Liam was ultimately drafted into the Red Bull Junior team and was subsequently announced to drive at MP Motorsport in the FIA Formula 3 Championship that year. Teaming up with Simon Laxonen and Richard Vershaw, he would achieve two podiums and finished ahead of both of his teammates in 11th overall that year. Now while that doesn't sound impressive to people who have been watching the sport for two years, and the more cynical of people would say that fellow Red Bull Junior Yuki Tsunoda had finished ahead of him that year, but one must also bear in mind that while they're racing in a spec series with the same cars and same everything, the teams are anything but equal, which is why you should only really measure a driver's performance against their teammates, capiche? And hey, Yuki and Liam were teammates in the Euro Formula Open Championship with Team Motor Park, and Liam did finish ahead of him in that series, although they both finished behind Marino Sato, so I'm not really sure what to make of that. And they would partner up again in the same team in the 2020 Toyota Racing Series at M2 competition, and once again, Liam would surmount Yuki in the standings. However, in the same team as both of them was one Igor Fraga. In what was a titanic battle between the two, Liam would just lose out on the championship to Fraga, which kind of took its toll. But hey, it was second overall and he was still ahead of some good names on that grid. Focus that year, however, was in Formula 3, this time with high tech, and now paired up with Max Futrell and Dennis Hauger. Once again, he beat his teammates here as well, and for a while was in contention for the championship. But what really didn't help his cause was when he sideswiped Jake Hughes in Austria, or turned the Hungara ring into the Gulf of Mexico. In the end, he had to settle for P5 overall, but there were still signs that this kid had speed, constantly up the pointy end, and without the overarching Prima text that some others may have had. For 2021, Liam has been kept busy with a dual racing program. In his first race weekend in DTM, behind the wheel of a Ferrari GT3 car, he broke through on debut to win the race, and arguably outshone teammate Alex Albon. I guess he raced him too hard. But it was an impressive performance from a driver who's never really driven anything with a roof before. Elsewhere, he has been competing in Formula 2 alongside Yuri Vips at high tech. Now, while Vips has what I call the Hulkenberg cause, whereby sh** just seems to go wrong around him, he is undeniably quick. And he's got a super license too. It's a hell of a teammate to have. But Liam's been handling the pressure well thus far. Yeah, there's been some crappy moments this year. What with Drogovic ramming him in Bahrain, getting disqualified in Monaco, and getting nerfed in Baku. Although, at least he was able to have a chat with the future goat of motor racing, but he has displayed some performances this year that have caught the eye of pretty much everyone. Daring moves, executed with pretty damn good precision, which was not previously his forte. I guess it highlights the fact that some of his rougher edges in his racecraft have been ironed out, and that's a good thing, especially given the likes of Pierre Gasly is kind of keen to hand his notice in Alpha Tauri, and that the likelihood of Marco re-signing Daniel Kvyat for the 8 millionth time is not that great at the moment, but I'm sure that some of you will be saying, Josh, you're a Kiwi you're biased toward him. And fair enough, but let me reiterate something that I mentioned at the top of the video. When Brenda Hartley entered Formula 1, I was beyond skeptical. I always thought that the likes of Antonio Felix da Costa and Naoki Yamamoto were more deserving of a shot at the main stage. Just because he had a New Zealand passport doesn't mean I'm going to give him a free pass. Even if at that point we hadn't had a Kiwi in Formula 1 for decades, and no race winning or point scoring one since the mid 70s. Without wishing to sound too proud here, this country has some incredible driving talent that really breaks through to car racing at all due to the seen amount of money required to go racing, even domestically, and then consider the cost of moving over and competing in Europe. It's a rare thing to see a Kiwi in the F1 feeder series, and even more rare to see one that you can legitimately say has what it takes to get to Formula 1. So... Does Liam have what it takes to reach Formula 1? Looking at his results, you may answer either way. Maybe you think that the likes of Yuri Vips, Dennis Halger, Jahan Daravala, or Jack Doolin have more potential in a Grand Prix seat than this guy. But there are intangibles at play here that you wouldn't get off of Wikipedia. And based off the on-track performances that we've seen from this guy, yeah. This guy may just have what it takes to reach that level, and more crucially, he may just be the Formula 1 driver that a whole nation has been waiting a long time for. Anyways, thank you all for watching. Drop a comment below, subscribe to the channel if you're awesome, and always remember, keep it respectful, be wholesome, don't be a manus, and as always, I'll see you all later.